Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this online session. Um, it's lovely to meet everyone. Good morning and good evening to all of you. It's fantastic to see so many of you here today with us. My name is Constantina Marzuko. I'm associate professor at the Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, Scotland. And Mindsets is our online community. It's an open community of practice that focuses on information, digital and media literacy. It's actually open to join for free, and it's a co-created community with our students and other colleagues who are all interested in empowering students' information literacy, media literacy, and digital literacy skills. So uh, we examine those things uh, and those themes along with the use of technology in teaching and learning. And really what we want to do is uh, examine how we can empower educators, but also students, to continue developing their skills. So if you're passionate about these themes, please do get in touch and let us know because we would, it would be lovely to see you to join our community. So for our uh, panel session today, we have received a lot of interest, I have to say. We have a, an excellent panel uh, with us today, and the event was sold out uh, before we could even publicize it enough. Um, just really, it's a sign of how much interest there is at the moment in higher education for exchanging perspectives on artificial intelligence. And, and saying this, our main objective today is to make the event as interactive as possible. We've got 230 registrations from different countries. So this offers us a great opportunity, I think, to explore uh, what we know is a still unmapped territory of generative AI, at least on the basis of research and what we already know, um, and in relation to assessment in particular. I can see many of you introducing yourselves in the chat here, so thank you very much and welcome. We have people from uh, several different uh, cities in the UK, from England, Scotland and Wales, and also we have people coming from Ireland, Canada, the US, we've got from Sweden, we've got from Guyana, Australia, South Africa, we've got people from the NHS, uh, from other departments of the UK public sector, and also we have publishers, private companies, and of course, many students in this session. So I think it's going to be very interesting. I wanted to thank you for your continued interest, uh, interest actually, and uh, focus on our webinars and our workshops online and the support that you've shown the basis of attending. And our effort is driven by community spirit and um, as you can see, as I said already, we want your views, you, we want your ideas, and we have some interactive activities here. Um, so um, you will see that uh, we have a poll already and ask you where you're coming from. So we'll make this available uh, a bit later when we start um, having a chat and having an exchange of ideas. Today on the social media, Twitter, we've got Amanda Brennan from Glasgow Caledonian University who is tweeting for, tweeting for us. So please uh, use the, I think I've got it on the first uh, slide. No, I've got it here on the second slide. So um, hashtag mindsets AI uh, HC is the hashtag we are using. And um, also we'll have a couple of Mentimeters activity. So Mentimeter is an interactive tool that would like you to add your opinions. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that uh, generative artificial intelligence uh, tools, as you know, such as ChatGPT, can be used to create new content, video, uh, audio, text, or as you know, and there have been there have been many breakthroughs here. But I think this um, discussion is both about the challenges and the opportunities. Uh, the opportunities to take um, generative AI tools to the next level in terms of creativity. Uh, designing, optimizing uh, processes, but also think about the ethics, academic integrity, personal data, digital exclusion issues um, that are really the, the big themes we discuss now in terms of generative AI. AI. So um, now, I think that's all I had to say, really. What I would like to do now is um, start with an interactive activity and kick off this session. So the first uh, question we have for you, uh, and we're gonna be using the Mendy tool. So please go to mendy.com 
and there is um, there is a uh, the code here. I hope you can all see that. I can type this into the, the chat as well. Um, so we have this code. Please add your ideas so we can have them as um, we are discussing these issues. So um, I just placed the code in the, the chat. What are your experiences? So this can be challenges or opportunities if you are already using generative AI, such as ChatGPT or could be other tools, Google Bard or anything you use. Uh, or if you don't use them, what do you think would be those challenges and opportunities if you don't have those experiences? Um, so please add your ideas there so we can um, um, really have a chat and have a conversation. So with this introduction, um, I would like to invite now uh, Kerstin uh, from uh, Glasgow Caledonia University to introduce the speakers and our theme for today. So over to you, Kerstin. Thanks, Dina. Um, and I'll just also say welcome to everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining our panel event uh, and, uh, on AI in higher education today. We know we have participants from all over the world, as Dina's just said, um, so that's lovely. Uh, and we also have some really esteemed speakers joining us today. Um, and in the order that you can see them on the screen, um, we have Professor Helen Partridge. Uh, Helen is Pro Vice Chancellor of Teaching and Learning at Deakin University in Victoria, Australia. Um, she's an active member of the Australian and international library and information profession. And her research explores the interplay between information, learning, and technology. Um, she's published widely in the area of teaching and learning and has received a number of teaching awards. So welcome to Helen this morning. Uh, we're also joined by Professor Philip Dawson, also from Deakin University, um, where he's the co-director of the Center for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning. Um, Phil actually studied AI and cybersecurity before undertaking his PhD in higher education. His research and publications focus on assessment validity in a digital world. And in his spare time, he performs improv comedy and produces the academia themed comedy show, The Peer Review. Uh, and from GCU London, we are joined by Dr. Alison Wilde. Um, Alison is a senior lecturer and assistant professor. Her roles in relation to security standards and internet governance, including with the UN, are just too many to mention. Um, and her recent publications focus on AI and cybersecurity at the intersection of trust, non-trust, norms, and cooperation. So um, in the first instance, I'm going to ask Bill if he could start us off by sharing his perspectives on how we could look to redesign assessment in a world of AI. And we can see our main themes uh, there this morning. Hi, Phil. Hello. Uh, thank, thank you so much. It's a joy to be here with everyone. I'm coming from Melbourne on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And I want to talk assessment and generative AI. I guess before I get to assessment exactly, I want to say, to me, it really matters that the people who graduate from our institutions can say, can do what we say they can do. And, and that's a, that's a really, really big and important thing. It matters because society trusts us to only graduate people who we certify and that people can do what we certify them. on. Now to do that, we need assessment. And the challenge at the moment is that a lot of what we've traditionally assessed can now be done by generative AI. Now, not necessarily to a fantastically high standard right now, but to a good enough standard. And in some assessments, certainly to a very good standard. If you look at the US bar exam uh, to practice law, if you look at US medical licensing exam, we're at the point where AI is performing better than a, a student performs to pass those. So we're, we're at that point where AI can do a lot of what we've traditionally assessed. Um, some people have responded to that by saying, well, let's ban it. Let's try to detect it. And, and this is really not an approach that we can do. It doesn't really work right now. The AI detectors, 
that have been pushed out there don't really work. The papers that have been published suggest they don't work. Um, there's problems with false positives. There's problems with sort of bias. Um, so there are, are concerns about our ability to, to detect it. And we can't really block people from using it or stop them. I'd argue as well that we probably shouldn't try to go down that, that line of thinking anyway, because ultimately assessment needs to prepare students for their future and not for our past. So our students are going to go out into a world where AI is pervasive. It's everywhere and it's just part of how we get things done. We already know that this happens. We already know that in a lot of fields, using AI as some sort of co-pilot, it's just really, really common. I have a friend who was a copywriter and he used to write copy. He still is technically a copywriter, but now he writes with AI and that, that's the way he does it. Or actually he doesn't just write with AI because he got into the AI stuff early. He runs a team of people who write with AI. And, and this is the changing nature of work. So we need assessment to prepare students for that future. Now, in doing so, we're going to have to really question um, how we assess students and when we need to see them do something without any AI and when we need to see them do something with AI. I've got a few thoughts in that space as to what might help us uh, make our decisions there. One of the tools is to really look at the learning outcomes across our degrees and question um, when do we have uh, tasks that are kind of busy work or anything like that that's extraneous to the learning outcomes being assessed? And I'd say in those moments, certainly let's let students use AI. We also might want to look across our degree programs and say, well, do we see students do something multiple times, the same outcome being assessed multiple times, which is a good thing for us to develop a good understanding of what students are capable of. But if we do assess the same outcome multiple times, maybe once you've demonstrated you can do it on your own, maybe you get to do it with the assistance of AI into the future. Uh, next time you get on an airplane, think to yourself, okay, first thing to yourself, mute my microphone. Uh, secondly, think to yourself, um, do I want a pilot who can fly the airplane when the instruments work? Or do I want a pilot who can fly the airplane when the instruments fail? And you probably want the pilot who can do both. You want the pilot who can fly the airplane without all this technological assistance because it matters that they can land it in a disaster and all of that. I was chatting to a pilot today who told me that the GPS sometimes doesn't always work when he's doing uh, private flights. But you also want someone who can pilot it when the instruments do work because most of the time the technology is there, it does work and it makes us better and you would not get to your destination on time without all those fancy tools. So we need to really question how we're doing assessment that prepares students for a world with AI and also how often we really need to see them do something without AI at all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Philip. That's great. That's lots of ideas there to, to think to think about. Um, and um, uh, we have uh, several uh, thoughts already being shared on the Mentimeter. So I'm encouraging everyone to, to put, put some thoughts uh, there. Um, that's fantastic. So we're going to move on to our next uh, panelist now. Uh, with our second theme. Um, so I'd like to invite Dr. Alison Ward, please. That's great. Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to thank Kirsten and Amanda for their very kind invitation. And Constantina, thank you too. It's, it's brilliant to be here. And it's a pleasure to hear from colleagues from Australia. It's really interesting to hear. My name's Alison, as we mentioned. And so following on from Phil's work, um, I'm going to talk about um, work related to my research with the United Nations and with tech companies and looking at very much the back end of this, so strategies for AI development and also um, considerations for, for AI governance. So we know <clears throat> there's issues at the moment with AI. Um, there's dilemmas there. We see the tech leaders at the moment calling for a halt to AI development at the moment on the one hand. And on the other hand, we see lots of companies running ahead using AI 
using it for healthcare, using it for there was there was um, in UK news the last few days that it's being trialed for air traffic control, and arguably there's risks there. And there was an article in the Financial Times yesterday about this. So it's really a pertinent issue at the moment. So the work I've been doing with the United Nations, the United Nations, usually a kind of quite slow organization, but they're responding quite quickly here. So following on from the Paris Agreement, from the Sustainable Development Goals, they've um, set up this new um, policy called the Global Digital Compact last year. And that's looking at how to achieve the United Nations goals for an open, free and secure digital future for all of us. And this is based on non-binding principles which will to protect data, to protect our human rights, and also to regulate um, artificial intelligence. And secondly, this year, uh, the United Nations have established the policy network. And what we've done um, is we've consulted a multi-stakeholder group of experts and examined the current state of um, AI governance around the world. And we find very, very different landscape of AI governance. And this, because of that, because of those differences, there's actually now a lack of interoperability between these standards. So they don't speak to each other. So the recommendations that we're going to present at the United Nations at Kyoto next month are to improve operability and to do that by building cooperation between different nation states, building capacity, building training, building opportunities for education and strengthening this legislative cooperation. The second piece of work I'm going to talk about is much more practical. So we, we said there's issues of AI development at the moment with lacks of, lack, a lack of transparency in the answers, a lack of transparency in the sources of the training material, in the sources of the algorithms themselves, and the processes involved in the decision making. So a solution to this is possibly to use closed source models. So I'm working with a tech company, Digital Companion, and we're developing a closed source AI model that runs off the cloud. So this is completely trained in-house with an auditable source of data. So we know what goes into the model. We're actually training the model for cybersecurity. So you can imagine we are compliance heavy, but using that approach, um, we can develop um, sophisticated agents within the AI model itself. So if you like the AI model has its team members sub team members and they can do different tasks so one can be a project manager one can be a coder one can be a communicator depending on what task is required in there and the benefits of this approach of using the system is we have auditability we have we can catalog we can classify we can record what answers are produced we can record the decision making processes in there and that helps us in address the big issues of copyright and compliance so summing up the two things I, I'm saying today we can do is for AI governance at an international level, we need to start by increasing cooperation and at a local level, working with um, AI models and building models, perhaps the root of closed models so that we can trust our AI workmates. So thank you again. I'm really delighted to be here and thank you audience. And I'm delighted now, I think we're going to my colleague, Professor Helen Partridge, thank you. Thank you so much. That's really uh, big questions and big issues. And I can already see some uh, interesting comments in the chat and in the ideas you are sharing, which I'm going to make available very soon. And um, so over now to Professor Helen Partage um, to talk about um, this scaffolding for students. So what kinds of support can we prepare for both students and staff? Uh, to ensure that uh, generative AI can be used uh, can be used um, effectively, ethically, um, and um, ensure that uh, we address all the issues that we are currently discussing today. So over to you, Professor Edward Partridge. Thank you very, very much. I'm excited to be here. And I must admit, um, when I was asked to talk a little bit about well, what Deakin University has been doing over the last eight or nine months in this space, it gave me um, a wonderful opportunity to pause and reflect because I think December hit, ChatGPT got launched and our world suddenly changed and we've been running ever since then. 
So using Deakin as a bit of a, a sandpit example, I wanted to talk through some of the, the elements, six interconnected elements that have helped us um, move forward and embrace chat, and embrace generative AI. So first and foremost, as a university, I think um, any institution, and Deakin's no exception, we needed to be, have a clear sense of vision, a sense of purpose. What, what are we going to do with um, generative AI and why? Um, and we wanted to make certain that whatever we decided actually aligned with our, our goals and our values use a university. So straight away, Deacon said, we're not going to ban Gen AI. Instead, we recognise that as educators, we need to understand how AI will impact and change the professions and industries our graduates go out into, and that we need to create curriculum, learning experiences, assessment that prepares our students for their future, not our past, as Phil has already said. So with that vision in mind, we need to start raising awareness and communicating to our core stakeholders, so our staff and our students. Um, we needed to make certain that they were aware of what the current emerging Gen AI tools are, how and when to use them effectively and ethically, including what tools we have available for them to use at Deakin and what the rules and expectations and guidelines will be. To do that, we used the existing um, processes that we already had at play. So we had already a teaching and learning newsletter that went out to all of our staff. So we had regular news um, articles in that, keeping people abreast of the shifting sands and things did shift quite quickly with Gen AI and still are. Um, the library was a, a really key part of communicating and raising awareness and understanding with our students. And of course, we use the existing um, schools, faculties, departmental meetings to make certain that Gen AI was on their agenda. Thirdly, we needed to think about governance. So we've got our shared vision of what we want to do with Gen AI. We then need to make certain we've got mechanisms to document decisions, evaluate actions and monitor progress to ensure all key stakeholders are involved appropriately and when they need to be. Quite quickly, our amazing Director of Digital Learning, Associate Professor Trish, Trish McCluskey, established at the very start of this year a Gen AI network. And this became our brains trust within the university. Essentially, it was a whole of university community of practice. And they involved members from library, from the learning and teaching support unit, from our faculties, our dean of students. And they were able to act quite nimbly and agilely to identify, well, where are the pain points? What are the things happening? Who needs to support when and how? And to make those things happen quite quickly. Through that group, we were able to check to make certain our policies and our procedures still would allow us to do what we want to do with Gen AI. Um, through that group, we were able to develop guidelines. So, for example, the Dean of Students developed for our academics um, some guiding notes on using um, tools for detecting Gen AI. And as Phil's alluded, we're saying, no, don't do that for many reasons. Um, the library and our legal team came together through that network to develop some uh, guidelines on Gen AI and rights management. Of course, the library developed um, recommendations for staff and students of, well, how do you reference or cite Gen AI in your work? We established a student Gen AI advisory group, and just recently we've formed a university Gen AI steering group, and that's at a whole of university level, because my focus is very much on well, what, what are we doing in the teaching and learning space, given my role in the university, but importantly, we need to have one ecosystem across the university where what we decide to do with Gen AI and teaching and learning aligns with and supports uh, what, what we decide to do with research in Gen AI and what we decide to do with supporting the business activities and functions of us as a university. Then, of course, we do need to focus on our capabil capability development of our staff and our students. So do our students, our staff have the necessary capabilities to develop, um, effectively adapt to their teaching and learning to, to, to take on board generative AI and to be successful? And that generative AI network led by Trish McCluskey and our student um, advisory group were really instrumental in helping us to respond quite nimbly. Evidence base, no surprises, we do need to have timely, meaningful and responsive evidence base to inform our decision making and our actions. We wanted to actually understand well, what are our students and staff doing with Gen AI? Are they actually using it as much as we think they are? What are their pain points? What, what are the things that they've got concerns or questions about? And we've literally just had a survey go out to all of our staff and students where we're gathering all that and, and analysing that to now. Um, and of course, you've got Phil Dawson speaking today. We have the wonderful cradle within Deakin. So we can really take advantage of that great relationship as, as they are experts and leaders in the scholarly space in this area. So we, we want to learn from them. 
And finally, I think we need to, we have been and trying to acknowledge a, a community approach to this. So January is a bit of a watershed moment for higher ed and for the workforce and industries and professions, we're not alone. So we've intentionally gone to talk to others across the Australian higher ed sector and internationally to learn from each other and to not reinvent the wheel and to actually co-create things. And importantly, we're spending a lot of time talking to our academics to say, you need to think not about your own individual work within your institution, but go talk to the professions, go talk to the industries that your students are going out to be graduates in and see what we can do to learn from or influence and understand how is Gen AI impacting those professions and those industries so that we can learn how do we need to educate the future students who go out and become professionals in those spaces? So they're the six kind of interconnected things that if I had time to pause and think, what have we been doing over the last eight or nine months? That probably represented. Okay. Uh, hello, can we still hear you, Professor? Yes, I'm done. Okay, that's I think we lost minutes. you there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot in there, but I think that's my five minutes. <laughs> that's fine. That's great. Thank you so much. I can say a lot. Um, your thoughts and ideas have a lot in common with both Philip and, and Alison in terms of um, thinking about the future and thinking about the big ideas, the big problems, thinking about authentic exercises, re revisiting our practices and, and how we're doing things so far, but also bringing some um, a systematic approach, isn't it, to, to how we address the issue and also research, exploring um, how students are preparing their assessments and how do we know, how much do we know already about Gen AI. Okay, fantastic. So uh, now, uh, so if you have already been contributing to the activity that I set you earlier, I set the audience an activity, now there's a second activity for you. Now you you had this um, interesting thoughts on assessment. So what we'd like to ask you is, how do you feel about assessment and artificial intelligence? And really the question is how you feel rather than how, what you are thinking, which was really mostly the first question. Um, so how does it make you feel? Please share some emotions. Does it make you feel? feeling scared, excited? Uh, how does it make you feel generally, whether you have used it or whether you haven't used it? So again, go please to Mandy. I'm gonna type it here, mandy.com. And then the code is 18370500. And I post it there. There's a lot of thoughts uh, that um, have been shared in the chat, but also in the previous Bendy. And please check the CRAD uh, link as well that um, gives some interesting suggestions there. So we're going to be sharing those after the session together with the recording. But how do you feel about assessment and artificial intelligence? Uh, this is the question. Uh, and I can see already there are six responses. And so keep keep uh, keep them coming in. Uh, and there was a poll. I don't know if you have all answered the poll. We've got 37 people out of the 105 people who are here in this session at the moment. So are you an academic? Are you a student? Are you a librarian? Are you admin technical or student support? Policymaker, publisher, do you have a different role? Please, please let us know because it's really important to see um, who is here at the moment. So we're gonna keep the poll for a few more seconds, uh, but also we're gonna keep uh, the the questions, both of the questions in the menti for you. Uh, okay, so regarding the poll, I think we don't have my, many more of you answering. So I think I'm gonna share the results just to see where we are. Um, so we've got 36% of you are academic, 7% students, 50% are librarians. Obviously, this is a very important area for librarians. Um, it's an opportunity to um, play an important role here, especially as all of these uh, themes we're discussing today have to do with academic integrity, ethics of sharing information, and students' assessment. 
Uh, admin technical or student support, 9%. Policy maker, 1%. <laughs> but it's okay to have a policy maker here. Um, and uh, there are a um, few people who have other roles, but we don't know what they are. So feel free to type them, post them in, in the chat box if you feel um, uh, that. Excellent. That's fantastic. So are you keep on adding your feelings there? I hope that you are doing that at the moment. Um, what we are going to do now, though, is um, really go to the previous, to the previous question we had about your experiences of um, using uh, chat, GPT, or any other um, really uh, tool, gen tool. Um, and uh, what I would like to do actually here is invite our panelists um, to give some thoughts um, about uh, these ideas that uh, are shared on the board. So uh, what I'm going to do is I will share, I will change my sharing and go to the, the Mentimeter now. Okay, so it should come up uh, the short now. Um, you should be able to see some of the responses. So this is the point where um, we want to start the discussion with you. As you can see here, we've got 44 responses about challenges and opportunities. And um, we can start by looking at them. So the first challenge is designing rubrics. Uh, writing course content and devising teaching activities, which is, I think, what um, several of our panelists mentioned. Um, uh, another thought is about not uh, clear university guidance. So there's no clear university guidance at the moment. Um, and we talked about how we can cooperate. I think that um, Alison touched upon that and um, talked about United, the United Nations goals and really building cooperation and, and capacity, not only between universities, but Alison talked about uh, capacity and cooperation between states. Uh, so, Alison, I would like to invite you to give us some thoughts around this. Uh, I know that many universities are currently working on this, so there would be university guidance uh, that is prepared by different universities. But how can we put together a network so that this kind of work that is taking place at the moment is not replicated? It's actually more collaborative, I would say. Um, would you like to share something? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's, thanks. Thanks for that. So thanks for picking up on cooperation. And this is central, I think, to the work of the United Nations. And I think actually there's lots of, if we start bottom up, for example, um, we'll, we'll be doing inductions next week. So I'm going to meet my new students next week. And the first thing we'll be talking about is their experience of AI. And I'll be really fascinated to go into the room and just find out what their experience is. Is it good? Is it bad? Do they know? Do they not know? What, what do they know? And also turning that around, the opportunities for them to get involved in policymaking are incredible. So the United Nations have calls regularly for people to contribute. Sorry, for people to contribute and help develop policy. So there's opportunities for students to get involved, the student groups, the student bodies. I haven't done this yet at GCU, but this is something that is really of interest. I'll be um, looking for a program representative for our course next week. So this is one of the things I'll be sitting down with the students saying, are you interested in this? Is this something you'd like to take on? And reach out to students across the university in different disciplines. Don't forget in the, in the university, we've got the ComSec people that know how to do this. They're probably building their own AIs in their bedrooms at night. Well, that's what these people do. They're up all night. That's why the emails come in at midnight. You know, we're waiting to hear from students. You don't hear in the daytime and midnight, you know, emails start coming in. But I think we can use, we can use that capacity that students have. They've got more, certainly more energy than me. Use that capacity and actually I ask students, why do we, why are we not putting this into their assessments? Let's get students to help us sort this out. This really is a big issue that's coming to us at speed. And I don't think we have, as, as academic staff, we don't have the resources to manage this. So I think we have to look to our student colleagues to help us with this, our digital native colleagues. So that would be my suggestion. That's a very I'd like to know what colleagues think. Thank you. 
Thank you. That's a very interesting suggestion. And I would like to know what our students think in this session. That would be interesting if our students uh, would like to share some ideas in the chat. Would you be willing to help to, to course building that capacity? Uh, please do let us know. But I've seen that Philip has raised his hand. So please, Philip, would you like to share some thoughts on this? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think definitely getting students involved is a great idea. I, I'd caution around the sort of digital native thing. Um, and an and interesting thing, if you go into the research on the concept of digital natives, you've got Mark Prensky declaring that students are digital natives these days and have all these capabilities way, way back. But then actually people empirically looking at it and finding that, oh, actually, no, no, students using a bunch of these social media tools or whatever does not necessarily translate across into other domains. And, and the digital natives thing to to a lot of researchers in that space is a bit of a, a myth or a, a yeah. So I'd, I'd be concerned if we apply that sort of thinking to this. Um, there, there is a, a whole bunch of expertise in students, but also in the higher ed sector. And I'd point to something we've done in Australia or in the process of doing at the moment where we got together with our higher education regulator, TEXA, we got 20 experts from across the sector together and tried to do some consensus building around how we're we actually going to deal with this. And at the moment, we're in a sort of an expanded consultation process, going to bigger and bigger circles to try and build some sort of consensus on a response to generative AI at a sector level. It's really hard work. It's um, a whole bunch of compromise and, and challenge and whatever. I think we we need to do it beyond any single institution. And I agree, we probably should be involving students in that as well, but we can't discount there are, there's, there's people in the UK who have spent their whole careers building up to the point where they've got a ton of expertise to address this sort of challenge. Yes, absolutely. And we have lots of ideas shared in the chat area. And we've got a group called Student Digital Scholars organized by Glasgow Caledonia University to help navigate this area, we've got this idea of do we need a, um, a roadmap um, in terms of really addressing how we, we tackle these issues. Um, um, so there are lots and lots of ideas, Asherda, thank you so much. And this uh, issue about the digital natives point, I think um, I, I agree with, with that um, to a degree. Uh, at the same time, I think that um, probably students are more open to experimenting a lot of times than we are open, maybe because of, you know, we are very busy really doing all of these things. I'm thinking now in welcoming a week here at the university, and, and I, I personally thought I will incorporate some Gen AI in my assessments, but um, I struggled a lot because I was thinking, okay, what is a legitimate thing to do? Um, should I be pointing my students towards that? What about the, the ethics of the whole thing? What if they don't want to, to try? What if they, they think that uh, this is not for them? So I think the digital natives point is one we can um, sort of consider, but at the same time, think about how diverse our students are in terms of the skills, the skills they have already, but also their demographics, because the, they're not always young. We, we have you know, mature students as well. So lots of interesting, and exciting ideas. Uh, please keep them coming in. But there are also lots of ideas here. So I was thinking, I'm going to go browse this code down and let me know if anyone sees something that uh, would like to pick as a point of discussion. And um, I'm taking um, the chat as well. So um, we have um, this issue of hallucinations with generative AI um, that we, we hear about. Some of you are experimenting. Um, lecturers want to know if it's cheating, uh, users are unclear about uh, what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, somebody else says that creative play is important, so experimentation. Um, so lots of challenges, phantom sources, prejudice, persuading students to use AI ethically. Um, so, but also positive things, it could save time, automate some simpler tasks. So some of you feel that it's really important to experiment uh, and um, learn more. I think I agree with this. Um, 
I'd, I'd like to really invite uh, Professor Helen Patrice here and because you talk about scaffolding and the six interconnected elements. Uh, and I, I think that what I would like to ask here is how can we achieve this scaffolding um, when, you know, in a, in a normal scaffolding situation, you would expect that uh, the person who teaches is really the experts, the expert, are they? And then from the comments here, a sense um, that there is some kind of uncertainty going on, which we're going to probably see in the, in the feelings that are shared. So I'd like to invite uh, Professor um, Helen Partis to share a few ideas about the scaffolding idea and how can we achieve this, please? Scaffolding in the sense of um, scaffolding the traditional idea of helping a student through a scaffold experience in their learning or scaffolding to help the university? Because I actually think from my position, um, I think it feels probably better to talk about the assessment experience, um, but certainly I'm looking at from a whole of university, how I provide a scaffold of support for the university to embrace, innovate and understand what to do with this. And I, I did see something in the in the comments as I was watching the, um, the chat there. Someone said, um, Helen, how did you actually get a, an agile response? My university is still umming and ahhing about all of this. Um, and I think... What we found certainly is um, I think Melbourne has the the honour, is that the right word, of being the most locked down city during COVID. Um, so COVID basically forced the folks who are in universities within the city of Melbourne over a two, three year period to, to not be on campus. And, and to be honest, the government kept changing its policies and its minds about what you were allowed to do and what you weren't allowed to do. And after a few months, we'd suddenly get excited and think we're going to be back on campus. So I, at least what I observed at Deakin, and I can say this because I joined Deakin in March of 2020, I had one day on, on campus before all of a sudden we're in lockdown. I think if there's such a thing as a, a silver lining in a pandemic, I think Churchill said that, that it taught us as a university that our, we can be nimble, we can be agile, we can make informed decisions um, and we can come together in a truly collaborative way to recognise, look, this is shifting sands. We don't know what the government's going to be doing. We don't know what our students really need from us. Um, we don't know what's happening with our international students. So in some ways, I think we've learned as a university to take informed risks and to recognise that things aren't going to be perfect. And from the moment ChatGPT got launched in December, we've seen it shift and change. You know, it's gone from being this free open beta product to now suddenly, okay, you actually have to pay for ChatGPT4. Um, you can only have a certain version of it. So we've been building upon the trust and the expertise that we have available in the university through our students, our staff, through Cradle, um, but realising that sometimes it just has to be a just-in-time and, and iterating as we go, and there's nothing wrong with that. Excellent. Not sure if that answered the question, but that's kind of the things I've been thinking as I've been watching the chat oh, and definitely. seeing what's on there. Yes, definitely. Please do. That's So that's the idea. And um, I, obviously, I'm inviting <laughs> um, you individually when I see something that um, really makes me think and I think it requires uh, more reflection. Philip, over to you. You have raised your hand. Yeah, just, just really briefly, I, I think what Helen said there uh, about sort of Deacon's response is, is really great. And she's not overselling it either. I think Helen and our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Liz Johnson, did an amazing job leading the uni through this. Um, I think at the start, there was an expectation from a lot of academics that we would have a solution that would be able to solve this problem. And and the deeper I get into this one, the more I think there's not going to be any one solution. And this is big, like really challenging stuff that we will find things that work a little bit better than what we did last time. And we'll keep evolving in small steps like that as we go. I don't think there's going to be a really big thing. And I think some of it's been sort of uh, expectation management on the part of probably all the different types of people that are on this chat. Um, you know, the, from uh, people in academic development to leaders to librarians of like, hey, we, we haven't got a perfect solution. We can do something that's going to work a little bit better for, for now. 
And at the moment, I think, Phil, we're also just trying to build that evidence base. I will go back to that because I I think we need to be careful of making assumptions. So I think at the beginning, there was a bit of a, a, oh, my God, this is just taking over the world. And there were some assumptions about, oh, every student is doing this. Every student's developing their assessment or their assignments with this uh, happening. And and there was a sense of we've got to do this. We've got to do this. And I think slowly the emotional response has died down and now there's a, a, a more, okay, we can do, we can um, crawl before we walk. We can spend some time actually genuinely asking and talking to our students, what are you doing? And I think we might be interestingly surprised that our students actually may not be using it as much as we think they are because they're still struggling to understand what it's all about. Absolutely. And Dr. Alison White, you have raised your hand, please. That is great. Thank you. So thanks, Phil. Some interesting comments there. And I think a, a potential way forward is actually to explain and educate what, what this all means. Because I think at the moment people are using social media and they're not really thinking about what it what it means to post a picture of themselves on Facebook, you know, at a party. Or, you know, use TikTok and show a video of their younger siblings. And they're not really thinking through what it means in the future. So, you know, my domain is sort of cybersecurity. If they're thinking about what that means, so if we explain what is happening in AI when people put their private material in there and they're not really thinking about what the potential implications are, because that's going to go into a database of a private company who's going to mine that data, they're going to potentially identify that person, know all about their life, and we don't know what they're going to do with that data when they're training their models. So that's my argument. And the piece I presented earlier on is saying, well, I really think we have a duty to educate students and, and ourselves to, to understand, well, what is actually going on in these models? What's happening there? Who's who's in control of the data? What data is being fed in? You know, people are suggesting now they put their emails in there and the chat GPT can, can, you know, make a little database out of their emails for them. Think about the privacy issues in here. So that's where I come back to the work at the United Nations. And all that guidance is there. And I think there's a disconnect in, in terms of who's cooperating with who, what information is is it is there, what's being shared. I, I think there's a there is definitely a, 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 a resource issue because none of us have time and resources to actually do this individually. So I really think there's a big issue, there's a big call for cooperation and I think going forward this is something I'd see we could all work together on and say well what can we do what can we contribute what can we bring in from our different from our different people across the schools don't forget we've got the comp sci people we've got the cyber security people we've got the literature people we've got all of the educationalists and librarians so we've got all of those bits of expertise but they're not they're not in the same place at the same time thanks Thank you so much for these uh, thoughts, and and there are um, so many um, important messages shared in the in the text uh, here in the chat, um, and also the the, the really this um, openness to networking and sharing and working together, as you are saying. Um, so please check, for example, University of Queensland Library has developed some useful guidance on citing and referencing um, ChatGPT and other generative AI tools. Um, but also there's, there's another idea that is shared, uh, uh, Kari has said that many students will see the review as a routine rather than a, as an investigation or discovery. So they, they try to cut corners. We need to shift our making schemes to reward discovery, surprise, new thinking, interrogation of claims, proposals for the way ahead. So there is, there is I think, this kind of willingness from everyone to maybe create that network. I don't know if that can be the outcome of this session today, but uh, would we'll be very keen to perhaps um, help towards that goal and maybe uh, initiate that initial, um, like getting together and, and thinking about how we can address these issues as a collaborative approach rather, rather than as a, an individual and in silo approach as we, we have, I think, so far been doing, most of us. Um, okay, so lots and lots of ideas shared. So what we're gonna do is we will share those um, reflections, challenges and opportunities with everybody. Uh, and what I would like to do now is because obviously we had another 
um, activity for you, and that was mostly about your experiences. Sorry, most about your feelings, not your experiences. And, and I think that would be an interesting one to to look at uh, when I share it, because um, you know how we feel makes us um, really uh, plan activities. Um, and maybe this network that we're talking about is going to be materialized if we all are more open about these feelings and how we, we really not only plan to address the issues, but uh, how we can overcome sometimes these feelings of confusion, uh, worry, and make them really positive feelings of opportunity, of uh, you know being... Uh, transformative uh, and being um, really empowering for both the students and for staff. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing my screen altogether now and I will reshare because I think uh, I've got it in front of me so you can all see those feelings um, and you can see them now. Uh, let me see if I can make them a little bit uh, larger which can give me a second because there's a lot of things going on obviously in our uh, screens uh, here so we have uh, the feelings but you can see them right can you see them okay are they the fonts big enough for everybody you can see them thanks dina Okay, no problem. So, um, excellent. I can hear some music. So please uh, make sure that you have muted your uh, microphones as well. So, how is the audience feeling about uh, generative chat, um, chat GPT, and Google Bart and all of these uh, tools that we have uh, available to us these days? So, I will start with an interesting feeling of being feeling transformative. Um, so there's a sense of change here, isn't it? Um, so, so, but if we look at, at the center one, I think the biggest uh, feeling is excitement and curiosity. Uh, of course, as some of you are apprehensive and uh, confused and concerned and challenged, but there are some positive uh, directions in terms of feeling fascinating, fascinated, in feeling optimistic, um, which is really a positive thing. And it gives us, uh, I think, the platform to aim for this kind of design of a network and, and cooperation and working together. So um, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Philip, Do Philip Dawson for this one, because I know that this is one of the activities that you normally run, Philip, with uh, uh, when you are presenting this topic. And I'd like to know, how does this compare with uh, the feelings that your students are sharing with you when you are running this, those sessions on AI? And do they feel challenged? Do they feel excited? Yes, yeah, so I've, I've run this one with, with staff at a whole bunch of different places recently. So I've, I ran it with people in Calgary and North America and Winnipeg and uh, UCL, Kings, uh, Dublin, a bunch of different places. These are pretty typical yeah. feelings. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting how kind of universal these are. Um, I think someone's microphone's gone off. Yes, here. yes. Please, uh, please make sure you mute all your microphones. Yeah, the, the ones, like I think it, it's interesting sort of the, the mixture of ones that have sort of a positive or negative valence uh, or kind of something in the middle because there is still a, an amount of something in the middle here. Um, I think feeling like the world's passed me by is a really interesting one, you know, like I had it, I was with it, and then what <laughs> was it I'm, I'm no longer with. Um, I think that there's some stuff around sort of creativity and the arts and, and that, and that's really fascinating too. And I think this hits different disciplines in different ways. I was chatting with people from a creative arts faculty today who were, were really concerned for their students, for the sort of livelihoods that their students might have had in the past and how that's going to be really different. Because so I think a lot of this hits people in their employment, in their in their way of, of earning a living, and it's kind of scary. So, yeah, uh, somewhat typical, but also, you know, very real. So people can understand their feelings are 
uh, real feelings other people are having. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this idea, this feeling of it has passed me by, and uh, you know, and and also, I think how oh yeah, how can we keep up with all of these technological advancements is obviously the question. Um, but perhaps this idea of cooperation uh, may solve this because I think that we are experts in different ways, and um, you know, from one point of view, we've got the the student expertise, somebody. Uh, who has actually experimented with these tools probably more than we have. Um, so I think, you know, what 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 can they contribute uh, in this discussion, in this cooperation? And we've got the technical point of view, somebody who is aware of how to really um, utilize these tools to the best possible way, in a creative way, in a way that can really help to um, uh, improve uh, processes and, and really be creative. And so I think, and then it's the point of view of this, you know, the academic integrity, the ethics, how do you safeguard data and information, which I think that a library point of view would definitely uh, be featured there and it would be a very helpful um, contribution. So I think for my view, it seems like from the uh, presentations and the thoughts we had so far, this cooperation requires different players, um, different players who have not only different perspectives, but also different experiences and expertise to share within that network. And we need to accommodate this and we need to make sure that everybody is invited if such a network uh, takes shape. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts and uh, uh, we, we're going to go to the to the chat. Uh, we have about four minutes left in this session and there's a lot and lot of, of thoughts shared in the chat. Um, should we take some of them and explore them, uh, panelists? Anyone? Um, I'll, I'll jump on the essay being obsolete or not comment that uh, Jeffrey's made, arguing the essay is not obsolete. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think it's really interesting how these tools are challenging some of our sort of default assessment types. We've traditionally done a lot of written assessment. Um, some people are really concerned that AI being able to do assessment really challenges things. I think that really privileges writing as a mode of assessment. And some people have said to me, oh, but Phil, all knowledge that that matters, you know, is is written or writing is an amazing way to, to figure out how you think or whatever, to which I say there are a lot of Indigenous cultures in the world. Not all of them have written things down. They've all come up with some pretty profound things. So I'd really challenge that. Uh, default writing as as the best, and yeah, uh, if if we stop writing so much because AI can do it in assessment, I'm not so worried. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I'd like to uh, mention Mike's point here in the chat that many of the skills that students need to develop to be AI literate are not far removed from what librarians are already teaching information literacy sessions. So that's an interesting point. So because it has to do with these broader uh, values and strategies and the critical engagement with information. Um, so I think, you know, if we look at it from the point of view of this is another tool, isn't it? Uh, we did have different sources. I remember in the old days when we had search engines, for example, there was so much discussion about search engines doing the work for you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but um, Dr. Armstrong, you have raised your hand, please. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thank you. So again, uh, coming back on issues of creativity. So in my um, slide that I provided, uh, there's an image in there, which is an AI generated image. And this was from our closed source AI system, which has not been educated about GCU or Glasgow or anything, but the prompt was, you know, draw a, a Glasgow skyline, you know, with a bit of sun, which is not unusual in Glasgow, but not always the case. And that's the image that it came up with. So as Phil said, you know, we don't necessarily have to preference written text, but we can certainly look at other opportunities for looking at um, how we can engage students potentially with assessment. So comparison. So, for example, there's the image, the photograph of GCU, and then there's the AI rendered version. 
And there's some striking similarities, but of course there's massive differences. So there's lots of possibilities in there of really interrogating. This comes to, I suppose, to critical thinking. I'm not an art scholar, so please don't ask me about the scholarship for arts, but I'm sure our arts team will be able to, to really grab some of this and, and look at how this could be useful in terms of, you know, comparison. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing these thoughts. So we do have one minute left in the session. So um, now I'm thinking that it would be lovely if we could start a network. Uh, so my thoughts are the following. We do have our email here, one HC Mindsets. Um, and uh, if uh, whoever is interested to actually to set up a network like that, and we're looking for people who are coming from different perspectives, that have different roles, uh, please do email us. Please do email us and let us know that you're interested to be part of a network like that. Um, so we could make a start. We could organize more sessions like this, more interactive sessions. And, and we can work together. So I think that would be hopefully the outcome of this interactive session today. Um, so there could be more follow-up sessions and, and more sharing of practice, uh, expertise, and, and, and really experience as we're all learning and as we're all experimenting and as we're all designing guidelines and, and strategies to, to address uh, these issues. Okay, so that's all the time we had for, for this session today. I'd like to thank everybody for um, being so proactive. Um, now we are going to stop the recording. The idea is that we're going to be sharing the recording, but also uh, some of the ideas shared and also uh, your thoughts on the Mentimeter, which was uh, really important. Uh, it's been lovely to have our guest panelists. Um, a great opportunity. Uh, we are delighted that we had that, that uh, chance actually in our community. So thank you all very, very much and, and we'll see you all very soon.